profession as a teacher, professor, doctor, lawyer, whatever it is, you know, you take it and make it wonderful day by day. You begin to study it and understand it and work on it and find ways to make it better. That's what cultivation is. Oh God, our help in ages past, our hope for years to come, our shelter from the stormy blast, and our eternal hope under the shadow. Sufficient is thy arm alone, and our defense is sure. Before the hills in order stood, for earth received her frame from everlasting. Thou art God to endless years the same. A thousand ages in thy sight are like a meaning long. Short as the watch that ends the light before the Praise God. There needs to be certain definite spiritual beliefs. Your spiritual belief is very important. Your beliefs uh, of what you embrace as spiritual beliefs are very important because that makes you what you are. And that, uh, that determines your life on all levels in spirit, soul and body, in economics, everywhere. In your economic life also is determined by what you believe. So what you believe spiritually is very important. I said about spiritual beliefs, I first dealt with the fact that we need to believe that there is a God who is a living God that watches over us. And one day we are going to give account to everything. How we have dealt with our life, how we have spent our life, how we have used our life and so on. One day we are going to give account to him. Going to give, we are going to give account to him for every day, every minute, and every resource that he has placed in our hand, we are going to give account to him. That makes a big difference in people's lives. When you live with that consciousness, see that is why the first two commandments are important in the Ten Commandments. What is the first commandment? The first commandment is that you shall have no other gods. Second commandment is about you shall have no images, man-made images. Why? What's wrong with images? What's wrong with the other gods and images? The thing is, when you have images, particularly images, when you have images, what you end up doing is you think that God is somewhere in some building, in some church or well, in a worship place. So you just go and present yourself before that God and worship and go home. And you are not conscious of that God watching over you. And... Uh, knowing what you're doing. You're just visiting that God, going to that place, attending to something and going back. But that God says, no, no, don't do that. Because that will completely give you a different perspective about who I am. I am not that God who sits in a building. I am a God who is a spirit. I am everywhere. You better know it. I, if you go to 
if you go and hide in somewhere in another planet i am there eh? if you go down all the way to hell also i am there he says eh? you don't you go anywhere there is nowhere in this whole universe that you can go to where god is not there you cannot escape from my sight and my supervision i am watching over you so don't put me in a little image and put me in a corner in a building because if you do that then it you get a misrepresentation of who i am and you do not live with the consciousness that i am watching over you so this became a very important factor factor in the pro, uh, doctrine in the protestant life you know uh, about having no images and uh, because this gives us the uh, gives us the consciousness that god is watching over us he is with us all the time that i am doing my duties my work and everything in his presence and i am accountable to him but the second thing is what i want to uh, uh, spend some time on today the second thing is this that god wants and uh, desires several character traits related to work and productivity in us if you want to prosper materially then god wants certain character traits to be present there that is a factor in prosperity even the other day one person was telling me writing to me he says well you preach on prosperity but look at how many people they have nothing how many people they have you know what's they use like you know well that's right you know but why a lot of people don't have nothing it's not because god wants them not to have anything that like couple of weeks i spent on it you shall have no poor among you god says that's god's will god is not making people poor god doesn't want people poor then why are they poor this person is saying you're preaching poverty but what prosperity but what is the use people are in poverty you know but why are they in poverty see a lot of people don't even pay attention to what we are saying here don't even look at and consider these things even some christians don't consider these things that we are talking about here what we are talking about work and productivity and all that and what the bible says about it a lot of christians don't consider that is why they never enter into prosperity now god has not got a magical way of prospering you know there's no magical way to prosper you see god can do miracles and all that but the thing is prosperity comes as a result of following the principles that god has set for prosperity i am not preaching some kind of prosperity where i say i'll pray today you go and open the open your wallet in, at home and you will find money there you know i don't preach such stuff that's foolish i'm not preaching and saying you know let's close our eyes and pray you will find gold you know all over the floor after i get through praying no i'm not saying that i am saying look at the laws that god has established definitely he has established to establish these laws to bring about prosperity and to retain prosperity why not consider them why not look at them okay so we've been looking at that there are certain character traits related to work and productivity we're going to look at many of them but i want to deal with one here right now as i talk about these character traits that god desires for us to have one particular character trait about work and productivity is that god wants us to look at our work with a particular outlook he wants us to have a particular outlook about our work and that is to think of our work as a calling from god that god has chosen us to do this work and this is our life's task that he has given to us that god has given us the abilities and talents and gifts to do it and when we do it then we are doing what god has appointed us to do now this idea is present all over the scriptures i'm going to read some verses as sample but uh, and during the time i'll probably mention the other i can't read everything but let me just read a few things here this idea of calling work as a calling work as a calling from god therefore why work as a spiritual significance work is not something that is not related to god 
Work is not something that is not separate from our spiritual life. Work has a lot to do with our relationship with God. God has made us, you and me, for a purpose, placed us here in this situation, in a place, given us certain talents and abilities, so that we may do a work which is part of his purpose for the whole world, that we may play our role in it. That's the whole thing. This is the thing that accounted for the prosperity of the Protestant people. Even the worldly economists have pointed out, there are several books that point that out, uh, this out. People that don't claim to be Christians or Protestants or anything, they point out that Protestant theology is the reason behind the prosperity of the Protestants in Germany and other places of the world where there is a uh, concentrated population of uh, pro uh, uh, Protestants. There's a, uh, there's a lot of prosperity, they say. And even as they live among other communities, they have pointed out that these people excel as owners of businesses and higher up positions, uh, being in higher positions and so on in Europe. In this, I'm talking about 16th century and 17th century. Now, the Protestants have changed. I'll show you why also. also. I'm talking about 16th, 17th century. Economists are saying that they seem to be at an advantage. Why they seem to be at an advantage? Not because of some spirit uh, of some, 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 something that they have imbibed somewhere else. It is because what they have learned in Protestant theology, what they have learned as a Bible doctrine, that is what makes them special. And one of the things they point out is they look at work with a totally different outlook. They look at it, look at it as a spiritual thing that God has chosen them to do this work. That God has given to them the talents and the abilities. And God has appointed them to do this work. This is their life's mission. That's how they look at it. They go to work with that attitude. While the rest of the society in those days looked at work as a nuisance. Looked at work as a burdensome task. Looked at work as when is this going to be over, you know. From the time they enter into the factory to the time they get out, they're just looking at the watch, you know, when is it going to be over, you know. I want to get out of here, you know. That's the attitude. But these people, because they're taught from the scriptures, they had a totally different attitude. They go with a terrific motivation to be productive because God is watching, they're going to give account to him. They don't do eye service. Because their theology is like that, their teaching is like that. They work very sincerely and they're very regular, they're very productive, they're very effective. They increase their skill level day by day. They excel in the thing that they do. It is all originating from the idea of calling. So the idea of calling is very important. The idea of calling, you know, the word calling in English itself was interpreted by Martin Luther, they say, to mean a divine calling, you know, a divine appointment with a divine purpose. He interpreted it like that. One of the apocryphal books he was translating from the original languages, and there in one verse, something about work comes, and he is telling about attend your work, you know, till the end of your life, attend to your work or something like that. And he translated translated it not simply as work with that word in German language. He translated it with that word that means continue with this task that has been given to you by God to the end of your life. That's the way he translates it, it seems. Now, they say after that only that idea caught on and, and, and so on. Uh, but the thing is, Martin Luther translated it like that because he got it from the scriptures. He was a man of the scriptures. And uh, I will read you some verses and show you where he got it from. Let's go from Genesis chapter 1, 128, the verse that we all know. It starts there. God blessed them after making Adam and Eve. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, and have dominion over it. There is the mission. Man and woman is placed here with a, they're placed here with a mission. They got to be fruitful, multiply, fill it, subdue everything that goes wrong and dominate over every situation that is not in control and bring it under their dominion. 
The idea of dominion is to use their authority and power to bring it under their control and exercise dominion because they, have the, they are in the image and likeness of God and they can do it. You know. So they have a task before them. The beginning itself, as soon as God placed them in this world, he says, be fruitful, multiply, fill it, subdue it, dominate. There's enough work there. There's a mission there. Second chapter, verse 15. Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and keep it. Some translations say to cultivate and keep it. Even in my Bible, the margin says to cultivate. So cultivate is a wonderful word. Cultivate and to keep it means to guard it, protect it. Two things, cultivate and protect it. Cultivate is a wonderful idea. It means that whatever is given to you, you make it better. That's what work is all about. These two verses that I just read to you give us a general idea about our work, the nature of our work. We look at work like this. Since it is given to us by God, we are cultivators. Whatever is given to us, whatever our task is, we take. And whatever is given to us, we take it and make it better. Anything. If a family is given to us, you're given a wife, children, you take it and make it more wonderful and beautiful, right? You're given a business, you take it and make it very successful day by day. You know, you work with it, labor in it, and make it beautiful. You are in a profession as a teacher, professor, doctor, lawyer, whatever it is. You know, you take it and make it wonderful day by day. You begin to study it and understand it and work on it and find ways to make it better. That's what cultivation is. Cultivation means that you are not in the same level that you were 10 years ago. You're constantly improving and progressing and flourishing, you know. That's what cultivating means. You take a land that is empty and has no crops in it and make it grow and produce. It involves productivity, shows productivity. That's what cultivation means. And to guard it is to protect it. That means to retain that cultivity, uh, cultivation. Retain it so that it's not robbed, it's not taken away, so that you don't lose it. It's for you to keep, you know. All these ideas are there, way back there itself. But let me read to you some other verses also. <clears throat> Turn with me to chapter 3. After the fall, after the sin came, work was affected very much. Work was never the same after the fall. Something happened to man's work. Work was a blessing in the beginning. He was a cultivator and protector. He had abundant resources, more than enough resources. But after the fall, look at verse 17. God says to Adam, he said, Then to Adam, God said, Because you have heeded the voice of your wife and have eaten the, of the tree, from the tree of which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread, till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you shall return. Look at the impact that the fall has made upon our work. In verse 17 it says, In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. The word toil indicates hard labor, work, is not just labor, not a delightful, enjoyable labor. It has become a hard labor now. That's what it means. Work is not easy. You know, you begin to hate it because, because of the curse, you know. And secondly, it says, uh, it shall bring forth thorns and thistles. Why thorns and thistles are there? Thorns and thistles are trying to choke out what is sown. To stop those things that are sown from coming forth and growing and giving you a good crop. They are a hindrance to your uh, crop. And verse 19 says, In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread. That again indicates the toil. So work has been terribly affected. Now, if you, if you think work, is, work has nothing to do with spiritual life, you're totally wrong, my friend. In the fall, one of the things that got affected was work, man's work. And through work, his material well-being was affected. If it's going to be toil, he's going to have a hard time making the money. If he's going to be 
if it's going to be that he's going to live out of the sweat of his face, then that means he's going to go through economic hardship, poverty, and suffer without money and food and, and, and suffer famine and, and, and so on. So economics is a very important part of life. It was affected in the fall. But then look at this. God is beginning his redemptive work. His work of salvation begins immediately with Noah, he begins. And uh, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. Every time you see financial miracles, that's why. Have you noticed that some people complain, what, this story is of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Joseph is full of economics. It's always about financial blessings. Yes. Why? Because that is one of the things that got affected in their life also. Because the fall is working. The curse is working. Because the curse is working, there's no water wherever Isaac goes. Because the curse is working, there is somebody to pull them down and trample on them everywhere they go. Because the curse is working, all circumstances are working against them to defeat them and to bring them into a famine situation, to cause them to fail. Because the curse is working. But God is working. The Redeemer is working. The one who lifts us is also working. So he gets in there while the curse is pulling them down. He is a greater power that is pulling them up. And in spite of all the curse that is working through the fall, Abraham made it rich, Isaac made it rich, Jacob made it rich, Joseph made it rich, and the people of Israel also made it rich. In spite of the curse. I've said many times, gravity is a law. It's there everywhere. If I step out of here, I'll fall down. Right? If I step out of here, I'm not going to fly. I'm going to go down because that's the law. That means a plane cannot fly. But how does a plane fly? A plane fly because of another law, the law of lift. That is made possible through those engines and the design of the, air, of the airplane. So the curse is like a law that pulls us down. But God's laws are laws that pulls us up there. If you are going down economically, I'm telling you, aren't you aware of the law of God, laws of God, that God has given to you just like he has given us airplanes these days. God has given another law that in spite of the curse you can fly. In spite of the gravity, planes are flying. People are sitting there. So the laws are pull, the, the curse is a law now. Since the fall, it's pulling down. But God's laws, every law was designed to lift you up from the downward pull of curse in this world and to bring you to the place that God designed for us originally. Every enemy will flee from the fire in his 
tremble, Jericho tumbles to the ground.